Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good to be together. We continue, as June said, through our series called Come and See. And uh, before we take a pause as we enter Lent, we conclude a section in that document, Our World Belongs to God, that speaks about the person of the Holy Spirit. And this morning in particular, about what the Bible calls the sword of the Spirit, which is the Bible itself. I want to talk with us about the scriptures about the nature of the Bible and its authority in our lives. And so we're going to turn now to the Bible, uh, to the second letter of Peter, and read a portion of that letter beginning at chapter 1, verse 16. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. This is the word of God. For we, that is, the apostles, did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Thus far, our reading from God's word. This morning, I want to talk to you about how it is that God reveals himself to us, to the world, and not only reveals himself, but reveals to us his purpose for all that exists. He does that in a number of different ways, but the most foundational of ways, the most clear, the most authoritative way is through the Bible. So this morning we're going to be talking at length about this most important collection of writings. For that's what the Bible is, an assembly, a collection of various books and writings. When I was in grade 10, uh, I took English, and the teacher of my English course was actually one of my favorite teachers in grade 10, Mr. McKenzie. And frequently in that English class, Mr. McKenzie would turn to me because he found out early on that I knew a few stories in the Bible. Unlike maybe most of the students in my class, I was in a public high school. Unlike most of the students in my class, Andrew seemed to know a few stories in the Bible. And of course, I grew up as a Christian, so I learned those stories growing up. Um, I don't know if this was prophetic, because at that time I had no interest in being a minister. He would often say in class, let's see what Reverend Andrew has to say this morning. (laughs) And at one point, after one of the classes, when we had talked about a particular story in the Bible, and again, he had asked, Andrew, what is that story? And I would try to remember it and explain it. After that class, I went up to Mr. McKenzie and asked him, you know a lot about the Bible, Mr. McKenzie. Are you a Christian? No, no, I'm not a Christian. I I think the Bible is really important, but I, uh, I kind of have my own religion that I cobble from different books and writings. But yet you think the Bible is really important. Oh, yes. 
In fact, I would say it's probably one of the most important books for people to know and be familiar with in Western civilization. Why is that? Well, just about every good work of literature is in some way connected to the Bible, or it makes reference to some of its stories or its themes. The Bible is a foundational book. In fact, the next day, I remember in our class, he shared that same thing with the whole class, told them about our little conversation, shared with the class that he wasn't a Christian, but that the Bible was a foundational book that everybody should be familiar with. Much more recently, someone who you know, I follow a little bit, uh, is a gentleman by the name of Jordan Peterson. And he himself has said on a number of occasions, speaking mostly to a non-Christian audience, that we ignore the Bible at our own peril. He said that on a number of occasions. It would probably take quite a while for me to explain why he might say that, but briefly, I think he would say that for this reason. He's not a self-professed Christian, though has a uh, sympathy for the Christian faith and even an interest in it, but not a self-professed Christian. He's a clinical psychologist who over his career has thought a lot about what it is that gives people's lives meaning and how that meaning motivates them and how it causes them to respond. And he said, the Bible is a collection of writings over the centuries that, that distills some of the very best wisdom and understanding about the world and about humanity that we, we can find in history. And he approaches the Bible as someone who would identify himself as kind of an evolutionary psychologist. And some of the best things that we know as evolutionary psychologists align with some of the teachings we find in the scriptures. And so he would say, we ignore the Bible at our own peril. Remarkably, let me add this. Some of you will know this. I think it was in the spring of 2017 in Toronto, he spoke in an auditorium for 10 consecutive weeks on the book of Genesis. Believe it or not, a clinical psychologist talking about Genesis, selling out that auditorium, I think it was about 250 to 400 people, at $40 a ticket for 10 weeks. I mean, a lot of pastors have a hard time getting a little crowd on Sunday. Here's a clinical psychologist talking about the Bible for 10 weeks at $40 a ticket, selling out an entire, an, an entire auditorium. We ignore the Bible at our own peril, Peterson would say. It is by far the best-selling book every year for throughout history, really. In fact, for the last 50 years, the Bible has sold more than 4 billion copies. The next best-selling book is a book called Quotations from the Works of Mao Zedong, the Chairman Mao. That has sold 820 million copies in the last 50 years. Harry Potter is third, 400 million copies. The Bible, 4 billion copies. The Bible is an important book. Most of the world seems to recognize that. And I haven't even talked about what the Bible says. But just from these comments alone, we have some sense that we ought to pay attention to this most important book. As we think about that this morning, we go to the contemporary testimony, Our World Belongs to God, and look at some paragraphs that speak about the nature of the Bible, beginning with paragraph 31. God gives this world many ways to know him. The creation shows his power and majesty. He speaks through prophets, poets, and apostles, and most eloquently through the Son. The Spirit, active from the beginning, moved human beings to write the word of God and opens our hearts to God's voice. God gives this world many ways to know him. The creation shows his power and majesty. The Bible itself testifies to how people can know about God simply 
through the created world around them. Think about Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. The Bible says that, that all people can know something of God simply by looking at the world. Even if they've never read the Bible... God has left a witness, a testimony of his divine power and his eternal nature simply in the created world. Or think about Acts chapter 14. There Paul heals a man who was born lame, had never walked in his life. He tells the man to get up and the crowd, amazed at what Paul and his disciples are doing, they thought he was one of the Greek gods, Hermes, that had been manifest in this person named Paul. And Paul said, no, no, I'm just an ordinary man like you. I'm not a god. So he starts to preach about the God who created the heavens and the earth. And he says that even though this God had allowed the nations in history to go their own way, God never left himself without a witness or a testimony in the world. This is what we read in Acts chapter 14 verse 17. God has not left himself without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. That daily care that every person receives from the world itself, from the creation, sun and rain, joy and laughter, this is a testimony to God's goodness. This too is how we might know him. Then the contemporary testimony moves in more specifically to the Bible itself. Prophets, poets, apostles, those three terms are intended to capture all the people that authored the various books of the Bible. Prophets, poets, apostles, they encapsulate the biblical writers, the human writers. And Paul says that their witness is most clearly seen in the revealed son, that is Jesus, right? The contemporary testimony says he speaks through prophets, poets, and apostles, and most eloquently through his son. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 1 says. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. When the contemporary testimony speaks about how God most eloquently reveals himself through his son, here's what it means. God's full and perfect revelation of himself is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what the church has always confessed. Jesus, when people saw him walking their streets, could literally say, there is God right there in the flesh. That's how the church has thought about Jesus. God in the flesh, walking among us. And it was this man who testified that the scriptures, that is the Hebrew Bible, is the word of God. It is through the testimony of Jesus that the Christian church has seen in the Hebrew Bible the word of God. We did not decide that the Hebrew Bible is God's word. The church didn't decide that. Jesus testified to it. And that is a most significant point for us to remember. And more than that, the very people who wrote the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, the very people that wrote the New Testament 
were eyewitnesses of this man. They saw him in the flesh. Even Paul, who saw him on the Damascus road, encountered Jesus appearing in the flesh there before him. And undoubtedly, Paul himself had known of Jesus, even though he was against everything he taught. Eyewitnesses in the New Testament, Jesus himself declaring the Old Testament as the scriptures, the word of God. That is how the church has understood the nature of the Bible as being the infallible, authoritative word of God. God himself told us in the person of Jesus. That's an important point. The contemporary testimony goes on. The Bible is the word of God, the record and tool of his redeeming work. It is the word of truth, breath of God, fully reliable in leading us to know God and to walk with Jesus Christ in new life. Record and tool of his redeeming work. It is the record of his redeeming work throughout history, well before Jesus entered into history. The Bible was already recording the great and mighty acts of God to redeem, to save people, to call them into relationship with himself so that they might walk in newness of life. But it is also a tool for the continued work of God's redemptive activity in the world. God continues to call people to himself. And he most often does that through the word of God. As we heard just when Marianne shared that testimony of this student in Vietnam. How the word encountered him. That is the Bible. God through the scriptures encountered him with the very living word of God. It is the record and tool of his redeeming work. It is the word of truth so that we might walk with Jesus in newness of life. And it's the Bible that tells us these things. Let me give you a few examples. John chapter 20 verse 30, 31. John right now at the end of his gospel, listen to what he says about everything that he's just told them in the gospel. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Bible itself testifies that all of this has been written so that we might have life by believing in the name of Jesus Christ and following him. Consider Luke 24. This is now after the resurrection. Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with two disciples. They don't know yet that he is the Messiah raised from the dead. But at one point they are made aware by God's, by Jesus's gracious revealing himself to them. And at that point, this is the sermon that every pastor wishes was written down word for word in the Bible because this must have been the very best sermon ever preached by Jesus, no less. Listen to what he says. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. There, the Bible itself testifies that the whole Old Testament is about the that ultimately is pointing to Jesus Christ, the full and complete revelation of God in history. And in this way, we see the power of the Bible, the word of God, because this is the means principally through which God has chosen to reveal himself, a revelation that often transforms people into new creations through the work of the Holy Spirit. Think about the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch told in the book of Acts. Philip is lifted by God and taken to this Ethiopian who's traveling to Jerusalem. He's not a Christian. He's reading the Old Testament, 
portion of the book of Isaiah. He's reading it and God in his good will brings Philip along his path and Philip asks him, do you know what you're reading? Well, not really. I, how can I know unless somebody would tell it to me? So Philip there begins to explain to him exactly what this word meant. Philip began with that passage and told him the good news of Jesus taking from the Old Testament a launching point which brought the Ethiopian right into the presence of the living Jesus. That's the power of the word of God. We see it right there in this story. And the man's response, remarkable. He says, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? That's the power of the word as, it is, as, as people encounter it in their own lives. Just last Sunday, you may remember after the service, we made it possible for people to come to the front and receive prayer. And a number of folks did that last Sunday, including a man who, who prayed that he might re receive Jesus as Lord and Savior in his own life, committing his life to Christ. Coming into a service, into this place where we know God is present, hearing that word proclaimed and being convicted by it to give his life to the Lord. Praise God. And as we read through that paragraph, we came across this phrase, the Bible is fully reliable. Fully reliable. How are we to understand that? That of course is a question that the church has wrestled with on and off throughout its history. Two words that kind of are more uh, theologically loaded words, but really are similar to this understanding of the Bible being fully reliable, is that the Bible is infallible or inerrant. The Bible is infallible or inerrant. Infallible in terms of what it intends to teach about faith and life. About 40 years ago, our denomination put together a little study booklet that accompanied the release of Our World Belongs to God, this document that we're going through together in our small group sermon series. And at one point in, in this study guide, this is what we read about uh, the full reliability of the Bible. Adherence of infallibility and inerrancy Take the Bible seriously as the foundation for Christian faith and life. For the crisis of secularism demands a firm biblical commitment by modern Christians. For us, as for the reformers, scripture is necessary for knowing the truth. It is sufficient for salvation. It is clear in its witness to Jesus Christ and it is authoritative for living the Christian life. This is a very helpful way to think about how the Bible is infallible or even inerrant. Many people don't like that word inerrant, but let's stick with infallibility. The Bible is necessary for knowing the truth, sufficient for salvation, clear in its witness to Jesus Christ, and authoritative for living the Christian life. Therefore, the church has confessed, and then now it's quoting from one of our confessions, the Belgic Confession. It says that we receive all these books and these only as holy and canonical for the regulation, foundation, and confirmation of our faith, believing without any doubt all things contained in them. Necessary, sufficient, clear, and authoritative. I want to take just a few minutes to talk about one of those things. And that is the nature of the Bible's authority. How does the Bible have authority for the church today? And when I ask that question... It's a really important one because in some sense, in the last several decades, the church in the West, principally in the West, has been wondering about the Bible's authority, particularly as the church has been confronted with 
the question of, is it permissible for two women or two men to be married? The question of same-sex marriage, or more specifically in the Bible's terms, same-sex sex. The Bible doesn't talk about same-sex marriage, doesn't know about same-sex marriage, but it does talk about same-sex sex on a number of occasions. The church has been wrestling with the nature of the Bible's authority on this matter. In fact, as June mentioned in the announcements, our denomination is. Our denomination is going to be discussing a, a report that, that holds up the traditional view of marriage between a man and a woman. And that is being questioned by a number of people in our denomination, number of churches, number of individuals. That's being quest challenged, in fact, in strong ways. And that's not just unique to our denomination. Other denominations have already gone through that issue or are currently dealing with that issue. What is the nature of the Bible's authority concerning same-sex sex or same-sex marriage? One of the things that has been taking place over the last number of decades is there's been a growing movement within the church, even among the more conservative churches or evangelical churches, that has been trying to argue that the Bible itself can be read to affirm same-sex marriage, or at least not prohibit same-sex marriage. This has been a, a, a lengthy source of debate among, does the Bible really say that same-sex sex is permitted? when it's in the context of a covenant relationship like a marriage? Because previously, people have read through the passages in the Bible that speak about that, and it's always in a negative voice. Man shall not lie with a man as though with a woman, a woman not with a woman as though with a man, again and again. It says that in seven places in the Bible. About 13 years ago, 15 years ago, in fact, uh, a fairly well-respected New Testament scholar, a Catholic scholar by the name of Luke Timothy Johnson, wrote an extended essay that was circulated quite broadly within the church. And at that point, he said something about how we're reading the Bible that many people found very helpful because he made a very clear point about how people who affirm same-sex marriage are reading the Bible. I'd like to share a little bit of what he said. So he holds the position that same-sex marriage ought to be permitted. But listen to what he writes. I have little patience with efforts to make scripture say something other than what it says through appeals to linguistic or cultural subtleties. The exegetical situation, that is, the, the interpretation of the Bible is straightforward. We know what the text says. And he would say, the text says, same-sex sex is prohibited. He has little patience with people trying to make the scripture say something other than what it says. He continues, I think it's important to state clearly that what we do, in fact, rejects the straightforward commands of scripture and appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. That's an important phrase. It's important to state clearly that we do, in fact, reject the straightforward commands of Scripture and instead appeal to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. And what exactly is that authority, he says? We appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to, which tells us that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. Essentially what Luke Timothy Johnson is writing is that the Bible is clear about what it says, but 
we must make an appeal to an authority that comes out of human experience, human testimony, that comes from people who have embraced their sexual orientation and believe that this is exactly how God has made them and that therefore they can live in the way that allows them to express that sexual activity. And this, for many in the church, is at the heart of the issue. It isn't just about same-sex sex. It's about how we read the Bible and the nature of the experience of, uh, sorry, the nature of human experience. Can it have the kind of authority that actually overturns a clear teaching in the Bible? And many are saying, yes. And if you were to read Luke Timothy Johnson, he would actually try to make that argument from various stories in the Bible. He will pick some different stories in the Bible and say, see, here is how God used the experience of human beings to change the way that the church had historically thought about this issue or that issue. For many in the church today, this lies at the heart of the issue on whether or not we, God permits same-sex sex. It's a question of what is the Bible's authority? And can human experience be elevated to perhaps the same level as the Bible's authority? We need a lot of prayer in the church because it's this very issue that will be discussed and debated as we approach synod this summer. It's about the Bible's authority. The next paragraph in the contemporary testimony is also an equally significant one. We read, the Bible tells the story of God's mighty acts in the unfolding of covenant history. As one revelation in two testaments, that's the old and the new, the Bible reveals God's will and the sweep of God's redeeming work illumined and equipped by the Spirit. Disciples of Jesus hear and do the word, witnessing to the good news that our world is to God who loves it deeply. Why is this a most significant paragraph in the contemporary testimony? This sense that, that God revealed in the Bible the mighty acts of God unfolding covenant history. Well, maybe that's best captured by something that Leslie Newbigin has written about a number of years ago. Leslie Newbigin was a missionary in India for uh, a number of decades. And at one point, he was confronted by a Hindu scholar. And the Hindu scholar challenged Leslie Newbegin about how he thought of the Bible. He, he told, he said to Leslie Newbegin, I can't understand why you missionaries present the Bible to us in India as a book of religion. It's not a book of religion, he said to Newbegin. And anyway, we have plenty of books of religion in India. We don't need any more. I find in your Bible, he said, a unique interpretation of universal history. The history of the whole of creation and the history of the whole of human race. And therefore a unique interpretation of the human person as a responsible actor in history. The Bible presents the meaning of reality as a whole. Hello? Good. 
Someone that we know quite well, or at least a number of us, Dr. Michael Goheen, wrote a book with the title, The True Story of the Whole World. And that's precisely what the Bible itself claims to be. Newbegin goes on to say, there's nothing else in the whole religious literature of the world to put alongside the Bible. One of the reasons, I suspect, why it is the best-selling book in history. There's no other book like it. The Quran doesn't compare to the way in which the Bible is written and what stories it tells. The Bhagavad Gita doesn't compare to the Bible and the way in which, and the stories that the Bible tells. It is an absolutely unique book that makes very unique claims. Newbegin says, what we've done is we've fragmented the Bible into little bits, moral bits, systematic theological bits, devotional bits, historical critical bits, narrative bits, homiletical bits. And he said, when the Bible is broken up this way, there's no comprehensive grand narrative to withstand the power of the comprehensive humanist narrative that shapes our culture. And we know about that humanist narrative that shapes our culture. The Bible, are, the Bible is intended to tell an all-embracing cultural story that shapes our lives. The Bible is the true story of the whole world. And because, as the contemporary testimony says... Not only did the Holy Spirit illumine, inspire the hearts of those who wrote it such that it is the very word of God. Not only did the Holy Spirit inspire people to write it, but the Holy Spirit illumines your heart and mind and mine as we read it. As we come before God in a posture of humility maybe even a genuine skepticism i have often said to people you may not believe in god you may be quite skeptical of him but pick up the bible and with some honesty say god i don't believe you exist but if you exist will you reveal yourself to me as i turn to the pages of scripture I've often said that to people. Because the same Holy Spirit who inspired is the very Spirit who can illumine, open up our hearts and minds. So that as we read those words printed on the page, they become, as the contemporary testimony says, the breath of God to us, the bread of heaven to us. They become the very words of God himself. No wonder that these words have such power. When I was serving on the board of trustees of our denomination, I had the privilege of listening to someone share from Back to God Ministries about an experience he had when he was uh, in the Far East. He encountered a group of people and they told, them this, told him this story. For generations... This community, a very small community, had one page of the Bible. It was torn out. It came from the Gospel of John. They had one page of scripture. And for generations, that nourished the faith of this small community. They believed in the Lord Jesus. They believed in the God that this one page of scripture testified to. You can't imagine how overjoyed they were when they received the full Bible. The bread of heaven that now had, had been given to them and, and now they had the full revelation of God. That back to God missionary when he reported to us at our board meeting was in tears. He said, I had never encountered people who had such a hunger for the word of God and had committed their lives to that God simply by reading one page of the Bible. And I submit to you, brothers and sisters, today, 
It's the living God himself through the power of the Holy Spirit that draws us into relationship with Jesus Christ as the word of God is opened and read and taken into our lives. This is the power of the word of God and our calling is that all the earth would hear that word in their own language proclaimed and read. Let all the earth hear his voice. Let the people rejoice. Our God is mighty to save. And all God's people say, amen, amen.